The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You Were Included, theologian Dr. Chris Kettler shares about the ministry and theology of the late Ray Anderson. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fizell. It's good to have you with us again. Thank you. You've just finished a book about Ray Anderson. Yes. And I'd like to talk about that. The title is Reading Ray S. Anderson, Theology as Ministry, Ministry as Theology. How did you first come to know Ray? Ray was one of God's great gifts in my life. I was a student at Fuller Seminary. Seminary students are a weird breed. Uh, they're supposed to be training for ministry, but they're actually still in the process of uh, wrestling through life's issues and uh, trying to really know God's grace. And so you usually go to a lot of academic classrooms, you go to biblical studies, church history, and so forth, and you try to translate into your life somehow. Well, a friend of mine recommended Ray Anderson to take a course from him, and I quickly found out that uh, this man wasn't just teaching about grace, he was presenting grace. And I quickly found out that uh, this was a life-changing experience for me. What Ray does, what is so amazing, is that we think that it would be self-evident that theology and ministry should go hand in hand. But when you go to a typical seminary, that's not the case. Mm. You have the biblical studies department over here, you have the church history department mm -hmm. over here, you have the ministry department here, preaching, and never the twain shall meet. Well, Ray was the professor, he was a one-man department, professor of theology and ministry. Uh, he went to both uh, faculty meetings, uh, theology and ministry, but really he was himself uh, a one department because he's a unique individual who was a pastor for 10 years before he went on for his PhD under Thomas Torrance in Scotland and, uh, and developed a understanding of a, a Christocentric Trinitarian theology in a vital dialogue with the ministry of the church. And he's made a tremendous contribution that way in relating theology and ministry more than anyone I know of. And he uh, has written a, a succession of books throughout the years that are very profound, provocative, controversial. And uh, I, made, I realized that more people needed to know about Ray. And so uh, last year I sat down and began to write this book, a kind of what, what I call to my friends, Ray Light. It hardly catches the exuberance and excitement and, and uh, creativity of his theology. But it, it's trying to just introduce people to some of Ray's thoughts and invite them to get into Ray, reading Ray. And I think that they'd be very much uh, uh, rewarded in doing so. Now, there are any number of directions you could take in introducing someone like Ray. So, what direction did you go and what... Uh... Well, the subtitle of the book is Theology as Ministry, Ministry as Theology, to, to communicate that in different ways Ray sought to bring them together. And, uh, and then I proceed through some traditional doctrines, doctrine of God, humanity, Christ and salvation, uh, the church, Holy Spirit, last things, but then look at them in terms of Ray's unique take upon them and, uh, and reflected upon his, in his teaching as well as in his books. And constantly you're seeing that uh, he refuses to have a theology that does not meet the test of being in the local congregation, meeting people where they're at with all their crazy quilt of problems and, and questions and frustrations and realizing that, that if theology means anything, it's going to meet people where they're at. And it, the kind of theology, that, the only theology that really does that is a Christocentric Trinitarian theology uh, that takes seriously, first of all, that God really has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. It's not just a possibility. It's not just a religious quest, but it's a reality that we thankfully and humbly receive by faith. And that revelation is of the triune God, that God is in a relationship of love as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then to see how that works out in terms of, of the ministry of the church, realizing that the ministry of the church is not our ministry. We often think that uh, ministry is, well, that's our part. God's done his part in Christ. Now it's our part is the ministry. 
And that's a terrible, terrible, terrible theology. And it uh, bears fruit in terrible uh, uh, practice because uh, we end up creating our own ministries, our own agendas. No, there's one continuing ministry, and that's the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ continues to minister. And Ray has written about that in many forms and developed a Trinitarian uh, theology of ministry that uh, reflects that continuing ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, he wrote a wonderful essay uh, at the beginning of a book he edited entitled the Theological Foundations for Ministry, titled A Theology for Ministry, in which he set out this, that agenda. And uh, even challenging theologians. This is not a case of just a theologian saying to lay people, you ought to read more theology. You know? No, it's quite the opposite. No, the ministry is, is the ministry of Jesus Christ. So ministry always precedes theology. But this is not sim simply to say that whatever is pragmatic, whatever is practical, then you kind of shape your theology on that, that basis. No, the ministry, remember, is the ministry of Jesus Christ. That precedes the theology. Then that should shape the theology. So theology should never be uh, distant from that ministry. Sadly, in, in theological education, that's almost the rule instead of the exception. Again, with separated departments and the, the biblical scholars never talk to the theologians or never talk to the ministry people. And Ray's trying to break that apart. And he's been a, a tremendous influence upon a, a generations of students at Fuller Seminary. I just noticed uh, at Fuller they have a, a plaque now that says uh, is named the Ray Anderson Classroom for the encouragement he gave the Doctor of Ministry students. Ray was the theological advisor to the Doctor of Ministry program at Fuller for many years, and he was the champion for that program. And a lot of his colleagues were saying, well, what's this Doctor of Ministry, you know? You know, a doctor is supposed to be, be for PhDs, not for ministry people. And the ministry were pe people were saying, well, gosh, uh, why do I need another degree? Or, and Ray said, no, we need to uh, equip uh, uh, ministers, pastors, after their MDiv to go on, continue to learn at, at, at the highest level possible. And he became a champion for this, these Doctor of Ministry students, and, and they, they appreciated that, even though he challenged them all the time with some very challenging theology. And he did that for all of us as students at Fuller, and uh, some of us didn't know what to make of it. I had a good friend of mine who's a black pastor in Atlanta now, and a musician, who uh, said to me once that he took one course from Ray, Ray Anderson, and he uh, thought afterwards, well, either, either this man is a genius or he's insane. <laughs> He was that much of a creative individual uh, in his lectures and his presence in the classroom. So as I thought about, back upon that and my own experience that, uh, that many of us went into that classroom desperate for the grace of God. And Ray bore witness to that grace. And I'm forever thankful to that. Unfortunately, we have his books and, uh, that uh, communicate that grace as well. And I want to encourage people to dig into that, knowing it's going to be challenging, but uh, it's, it's, it, there's a great reward behind reading it. His relentless uh, tenacity in not letting go of, of grace and, uh, right. and the reality of union with Christ right. and communion with Christ as who we are um, comes through so movingly, let me put it that way, in this book, The Gospel According to Judas. Right. You don't hear people talking about the Gospel According to Judas or even much focus on Judas, but in this book, Ray did take Judas as a, an example of who we all are, and it was so moving. Yeah, the subtitle uh, was, uh, Is There a Limit to God's Grace? Yeah. Which may seem strange, but unfortunately for most of us, Yes, we'd say there is a limit to God's grace, but why do we say that? And he, he questions that in terms of the person of Jesus and Judas, uh, a, and presents an imaginary dialogue after Judas's death between Jesus and Judas. What would Jesus say to Judas? What would Judas say to Jesus? Uh, and in a sense, would Judas refuse, uh, not understand that he's forgiven? Or do we have to condemn uh, Judas to perdition? Do we all need a scapegoat? And Ray explores this tendency we have to, uh, whether it be in a church or business or family, to always want to have a scapegoat. We need to have somebody to blame things on. And in a sense, he suggests for the disciples it was Judas. You know, he's, he's the one.
but Peter denied Christ too. And uh, we think, well, uh, Judas uh, demonstrates that there is a limit to God's grace. There's a, so far you can go with this grace business, or else you just get license and people will do whatever they want to. And so Judas is a good example. But Ray challenges that and suggests, well, maybe there isn't, a, maybe Jesus really did forgive Judas. And what would that mean? What does that say about grace? It would, it would mean that uh, if Jesus can forgive Judas, he can forgive me. That even though I fail him over and over and over again, that he can for, forgive me. And that, there, and that, in effect, that there is no limit to God's grace. We are the ones who put limit, limits to God's grace. God doesn't. And uh, it's a very powerful message, I think, about forgiveness that uh, received a lot of readership from inmates in jails. A uh, man convicted of murder wrote Ray and said he read his book. Can God forgive me? So it, it's a challenge to all of us to really rethink our theology and practice of forgiveness. Do we really believe in forgiveness? Do we really believe in grace? It's an honesty question, isn't it? Yeah. So often we, we hide ourselves from our own knowledge of ourselves as being sinners. Yeah, uh, we either pretend we, we're not sinners and then, and then we come out uh, as, as phonies or else it just becomes a uh, repeated uh, wallowing in the fact that we're sinners. Not that there were, first of all, that we're agents of grace, objects, objects of grace. We are objects of grace. And that our failings never deny that as, that, as was true for Israel in the Old Testament. And that because God's grace doesn't let us go, that becomes the motivation for us to seek him rather than to try to uh, appease him. Yeah. It's because he won't let us go that uh, we're motivated to love him and to serve him. And that's an absolute difference, difference of motivation. But it's the kind of motivation you find in, in the New Testament. And uh, when Paul in Ephesians uh, spends three chapters talking about we're blessed in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ because we've been chosen and been given every spiritual blessing in, the, in Christ, he goes on for three chapters. And then with chapter four, he says, therefore, walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've received. Because all this is who you are. It's already, already so. Yeah, because of this indicative. Therefore, then the imperative comes based upon that. It isn't that the imperative is the basis for you to be accepted. It's the opposite. Like in his letter to Titus, um, for, oh, yeah. for it is grace. For the grace of God has appeared. You yeah. To say no. Yeah, the grace of God has appeared, exhorting us to renounce uh, the, sin. The grace comes first. Exactly. And in, in the context of the grace, we're able yeah. then to move forward toward. And that's a constant problems. theme, of course, which, which Ray got very much from Karl Barth and, and Thomas Torrance, his, his mentor, and also from his own experience as a pastor in which he saw that many people had been wounded by the church. Uh, through most of his time as a professor at Fuller Seminary, he had a little church uh, meeting in a school, multi-purpose building, Harbor Fellowship. And it attracted about you know, 20, 30 people a week. They didn't have any programs, so if people wanted programs, they'd leave the church. But it, kind of, it became kind of a halfway house for people who'd been burned by the church. And they came to this little group, just gathering together, hearing the word of God, sharing communion, and Ray preaching a very simple yet profound sermon, uh, that people were healed, and they were able then to go back to the other churches. This little community of grace, if you will. So Ray lives that. He's lived that theology in the church, as well as writing about it. And it really, you see that in his writings, uh, much more than any, uh, any other theologian I know of. He never has ceased to be a pastor. There are plenty of professors in seminaries that used to be pastors, and they probably were failures of past being a pastor. But then they went on to get their degrees and become a seminary professor. Ray Anderson never ceased being a pastor. To the students at Fuller, his, his, his door was always open in his office, unheard of among seminary uh, professors. You could walk in with a need. And with the people at Harbor Fellowship, he continued to preach the word and minister to them during the week. 
and particularly with the, the DMIN students, mentoring them. Coming back, he used to say that they would come back uh, anesthetized to theology by their own seminary training. Theology was irrelevant to them as a pastor. He had to help them work, again, a theology of ministry work out, and that became such a moving experience to a whole generation of, of DMIN students. A book you use in your classes, you mentioned, as well as uh, one that I found very helpful and encouraging is uh, Dancing with Wolves While Feeding the Sheep. Yes, a wonderful Musi title. <laughs> Musings of a Maverick Theologian. Yes. So the, the wolves are uh, uh, the faculty colleagues who <laughs> actually can't, who had trouble accepting uh, Ray and his theology of ministry. Uh, but he still wanted to tend the, the sheep. And so he saw himself as a maverick theologian. And these, this, this is a remarkable little book that consists of questions, questions that people have asked him, uh, that lay people have asked, that nonetheless are profound theological questions. Uh, will Judas be in heaven? Is Jesus an evangelical? <laughs> what do you say to at the graveside of a suicide? It's very profound, practical, important questions. One chapter is remarkable. Does Jesus think of things today? And it's, it's a question that really gets at a very important point. As we read Scripture, is Jesus reading Scripture along with us? Or has he left the building and given us the Bible because he's not around anymore? Well, what kind of theology is that? Practically, that is our theology. But it's really a strange view of Scripture that thinks that we can read the Scripture without Jesus. When we think of the road to Emmaus, and Jesus himself had to explain to disciples where the scriptures spoke of him. And Ray plays with that a little bit, and just how we use and, and abuse the Bible often, and don't read it, read it in, in a Christocentric way, in, in terms of all scripture bears witness to Christ. But the, the chapters are very provocative and, and mischievous in some ways, but uh, very helpful in the end. Well, I hope your book will move some people toward wanting to become more, yeah, more familiar with some That's of the purpose. Work. I mean, this is just to, to kind of give them a taste of Anderson and some of his insights here and there and to move them into reading his books because I think there's such a rich reward in, in, in reading Ray. Many people may not know that Ray played part of a role early on in the transformation of Worldwide Church of God yes. in the sense in the early stages after the transformation of uh, being a support and a help to many of our pastors and uh, attending many of our pastors' conferences and speaking and encouraging our pastors. Ray has always been able to connect with pastors because he never ceased to be a pastor. At the same time, he's a world-class, top-flight theologian who will challenge you academically and intellectually as, 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 as much as you want to be challenged. And he's a, that rare individual that uh, does both. We've had the opportunity to interview him two or three times. Right, so those are wonderful uh, interviews program. too. Yeah. I commend them to the audience. A couple of your books focus on some of these same themes that, uh, that you were first introduced to with Ray. And one of them, of course, is this one, The God Who Believes, Faith, Doubt, and the Vicarious, of Huma Vicarious Humanity of Christ. And your new one, The God Who Rejoices, the God who rejoices Joy, Joy, despair. Joy, despair, and the vicarious right. humanity of Christ. Well, it's because of Anderson's influence that I increasingly saw that theology didn't need to be restricted to an ivory tower and deal with abstract or arcane or irrelevant issues. But that theology really at its best is taking the gospel and applying it radically to our struggles in our lives, such as doubt and despair and guilt and anxiety and, and loneliness and raised Christocentric theology reminded me that the solution needs to be constantly go back to Jesus Christ but maybe our Christology hasn't been healthy or strong enough and uh, through the work of his mentor T.F. Torrance I encountered this doctrine of the vicarious humanity of Christ and that says that the atonement is not just restricted to Christ paying the penalty for our sins. He did that. But it's not just his death that's vicarious in our place, but his entire humanity takes our place. So it very much came out of Ray's pastoral theology that I became intrigued with dealing with these issues, but also his 
profound Christocentric theology and the influence of the doctrine of the vicarious humanity of Christ, which I thought was had so much potential, does have so much potential for us to having a Christocentric theology of ministry. Often when people talk about a theology of ministry, it's just trying to be practical or just become more skilled at being a preacher or a counselor or a church growth uh, strategist or whatever. No, it's, it's got to be a theology. It's got, that drives us back to the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ and to the triune God whom Jesus Christ reveals. Uh, because otherwise, uh, we're just uh, trying to do our best to uh, do some crowd management in the church, or as Dallas Willard says, just do sin management. <laughs> sin management, yes. Right. yes that's right. uh, and rather, if we don't have that robust Christocentric Trinitarian theology, yeah. and it's so encouraging to me when I hear what, what you folks are doing at Grace Communion International in drawing out the implications of a Trinitarian theology for the ministry of the church. That's really the future, that's, and it's an exciting future in doing that. Appreciate that. Henry Nouwen wrote a, a wonderful book called The Return of the Prodigal Son, yes. about the painting on the cover, the newer cover, there's Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's yeah. painting of The Return of the Prodigal Son, and then Nowen goes through every aspect of that painting as it captures the pathos of who we are in Christ and the fact that we are held by those arms after everything we are and everything we've done ourselves, he's made us new in himself and won't let us go. It's an embrace of absolute, unconditional love despite who we are. Right. And it speaks to, well, the vicarious humanity of Christ, who he is for us, that he's made us to be, and our rest and our comfort that comes of that, because it seems like, as you wrote about joy and, and despair, there's so much despair, that's where we're coming from. And we see ourselves as just in despair, yes, God help me, but that God is still distant from that. Karl Barth, in his Church Dogmatics, has a wonderful section, his exegesis of the prodigal son. Do you, do you know it? No. It's fantastic. It's called, in a section entitled, The Way of the Son of God into the Far Country. He sees Jesus as the prodigal son. He's the one who goes into the far country of our humanity, our despair, our doubts, and so forth, taking upon our humanity, then is embraced by the Father. So that we're not left alone in our doubts and despairs and anxieties. That, that the incarnation means God has taken upon our humanity, and that humanity is the humanity now, as it is now, filled with doubts and despair and anxiety. And it's a Fascinating way of looking at the prodigal yeah, son. Yeah, comforting way. picture. Exactly, yeah. But very much connected with the Nowen's emphasis and the, and, and the Rembrandt painting. One question we like to ask everybody is we, at least at some point in, in, a, in an interview, if there's one thing you want people to know about God, what would it be? That God is love. And Christians always say that God is love. But that we know God is love because God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the significance of the Trinity. That God himself is in a relationship of love from all eternity, and that is made known, made manifest in the Incarnation. So that we speak of the love of God, we're not talking about just something that is a feeling or a sentimentality or something abstract, or even our ideas of love, but that love is at the center of who God is in this relationship between the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and that's why the Trinity is so essential for the Church. And that's the heart of Trinitarian theology, which exactly. this program is all about. Exactly, yeah. It means that God is love. It says what, that God's love means relationship in God himself, that he then has shared with us in Jesus Christ. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.